can really say uh, pretty much uh, in the introduction without a microphone. So we're going to start uh, going back to uh, belief propagation uh, as an example, basically, to see how the equations look like for uh, an undirected graph, and particularly for uh, a Markov random field. Okay, so we're going to see how the belief propagation algorithm looks for uh, an MRF that uh, has these uh, self potentials the way we have seen in the past, and then it has these pair potentials that you see here. Okay, so V are the number of nodes. Okay, uh, S of T are edges in the graph. So these are the S potentials, pair potentials, uh, and Z is the normalization factor. All right. So the uh, the presentation it looks slightly slightly different, but you know if you got the idea of message passing, effectively they are the same things. Okay. So what we're going to do is uh, we are going to assume uh, a general basically Markov random field. So uh, and we're going to sort of use the same ideas we did for trees. So you know you can take one node and hand the whole thing and say you know what well, that's the root and whatever is on the bottom is on the leaves and in some sense start sending messages from the leaves to the root that's the collect evidence step and then going uh, backwards from the root all the way to the leaves be before we are ready to calculate uh, uh, marginals and do uh, inference. All right. So uh, because I need to do this in uh, the belief propagation sort of uh, concept. I'm going to define what belief propagation is. So uh, let's take a node 2, I mean a node T, uh, that has uh, uh, children S and U, even though this is not uh, uh, you know, a directed graph, but you can think of this. If you hang it again from T, uh, these are the neighbors uh, are directly connected with T, so they are the children. So we define what is called the bottom-up belief uh, state of the node uh, T to be the probability of xt given the evidence from below. All right? So uh, the idea is that note t separates the graph, and this is the evidence coming from below. All right? This is very important. So this is uh, what is called the bottom-up uh, belief state. As you go from the leaves to the root, you define the belief state of every node, and it represents the probability of xt given the evidence below. Right now, the idea here is somehow uh, the way we have done in the past, we have learned how to propagate messages uh, from, uh, let's say, from the children S to uh, T, uh, and we write these messages as such, right? And uh, so, effectively, this message that you see here is the probability of X T given this evidence. And uh, from the graph, can you tell me what, what, what that evidence is? I mean, we did this in principle uh, when we work with trees and poly trees. So this message is uh, from S to T. It's really the probability of T. I mean, this is you know uh, the belief basically on XT given what evidence? What do you think this evidence is? It says V subscript S and T, and then minus. So what's the idea here? If I have an edge, uh, what is VST minus? Is the evidence coming from uh, what part of the graph? From downstream of what? The edge, not S, the edge ST. You remember if you take ST, right, this is a subtree, and the evidence that comes from that. It's really this message. So this message summarizes all the information, the evidence that you see here below this uh, blue curved line provides the node T. Okay, and so similarly to uh, this message, we also have the message from here to T, uh, etc. So the uh, bottom-up belief state of the node T, it is uh, nothing else but the uh, potential of the node X T times all the messages that are coming from below, right? So in this case, for example, this graph uh, from S and U, because this message from S and U summarize uh, all the belief uh, that we get from uh, the bottom uh, down, okay? So these are the children of T, 
And again, I'm using this in a liberal sense because this is not a directed graph where I have uh, a definition of children, but you can see what uh, this implies from this graph. All right, so we propagate messages, and the question is, uh, how do we compute these messages? And we compute these messages recursively the way we have done before, but now this is written slightly different. So the message from below, from S to T, it is um, a marginalization on S of the joint potential of the nodes S and T, exactly as we have done before, times the belief of S minus the belief of node S coming from below. So what is really the belief subscript S minus? Is all the evidence that comes from below S. Right, so you can think of this, for example, would be all the messages coming to S from its children. But now what I have done is, I have written, because I define explicitly what this is for any node, I am using the belief from below of a node to write this equation in a slightly different manner. So actually, historically, this is how things were written, right? But if you don't like this definition, you can go back to the old way I mean, the way we discuss it with messages, but uh, in the context of belief propagation, this equation is written like that. All right, so uh, you propagate uh, uh, belief basically from uh, evidence from uh, below all the way to the root, and once you reach the root, effectively, you have the probability of the root given all the evidence below, and effectively that, according to our scheme, is the marginal of node XR, times the product of all the messages uh, coming from the children of the root uh, to the root, okay? But the messages are coming from below. You can solve with uh, actually sort of a, a trivial calculation or zero calculation uh, that uh, the uh, probability of the evidence, the likelihood basically, is the product of this normalization factor ZT. And uh, uh, let me see where ZT comes. Uh, ZT basically is a normalization factor for each of these belief states from below. You may want to actually just uh, do a simple uh, 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 one-line calculation to convince yourselves that uh, if you take uh, all of these ZTs and you multiply them together uh, from the leaves to the root, you basically get the evidence, uh, the marginal likelihood, okay, P of E, as an extra sort of uh, bonus from this calculation. Okay, uh, so you list the uh, uh, root, and now you're ready to start distributing information uh, downwards the same way we have done uh, with message passing. So uh, now that, uh, as you start sending messages, let's say, from T to S, you are going to update the belief of S. And you notice now, because uh, when you start message sending messages from T to S, uh, you're ready to actually declare what the belief of node XS is, which is the probability of access given all the evidence because we accounted evidence from below and now we are accounting evidence from above, all right? So the, the, this belief of excess is P of excess given V and it is very simple. It is the belief uh, from, uh, you know, from the bottom up, this is on the first stage of the algorithm, times all the messages that are coming from the parents of no deaths. You agree? In this case, let's say T and if there was something else there. Okay, so before, you know what we had here when we're doing message passing? We had, uh, so can you remind me actually what exactly, how was this equation looking like before with messages when we didn't have this concept of belief? So obviously we had the messages coming uh, from above, from the parents, and here what did we have? So if you look at any node, all right, uh, this node not only receives messages from T, but also receives messages from what? You have to include the messages from below. And what are those messages now? They're inside uh, the belief minus of node XS. Some of this uh, reparameterization of the same message passing equations we have done, there's really nothing new here. Yep.
No, no. So, so we okay. So we went all the way up, right? We passed the we reached the root, and now we need to start propagating belief from the root all the way down, because a lot of these nodes have not yet received any information from above. So we need to update the belief of each of these nodes from information that comes from above, right? So. I mean, what he, you will see when we finish, actually, what you can do is you may say, why should I bother and have an upwards and a downwards mass propagation? How about if I actually uh, start sending messages in every direction anywhere, and then actually use one formula to update everything without going up and down? And actually, you can do that. The only thing you have to do is you have to initialize the message to be one, so there is something to send, right? And after that, you don't really have to go up, you don't have to go down, so the same algorithm, one step. And this is sort of what uh, is called, you know, using sort of an idea of flooding. You flood this whole thing with messages, uh, any node that can send messages, send messages. All right? But right now, uh, we are looking for uh, forward and backward propagation, and we're writing this in terms of these beliefs. So uh, the final belief of node access uh, having received information from above and below is the belief that we calculated in uh, uh, as we went from uh, uh, the leaves to the root and all the times all the products of the messages that basically come from the parents of uh, nodes. Alright, uh, and here is another uh, equation now that uh, deviates from the uh, in formatting again in parameterization from the message passing algorithm we have seen. So you may say, and what is the message that P sends to S now, right, as we go downwards from the root to the leaves? So that message is basically, uh, this is the definition, right, is the probability of XT given the upstream uh, evidence on the edge ST, and it's given by marginalizing, uh, so this is the information P sends to S, right, P sends to S, does this look correct to you? T sends to S. So uh, it seems I have messed up the summation here. Okay? So uh, the information T sends to S will be the potential of the uh, edge TS. Uh, and look at this now. Uh, in normal circumstances, you know what you will have? So you look at the message from T to S, right? So you will have to include. Uh, the messages that arrive from above to S, all right? But also you have to include all the messages that are coming from below. So look at this equation and tell me what exactly this is. There's no minus on this belief. So what exactly is this thing that you see, this fraction there? I mean, simple words. So we're looking the message from T to S, okay, going downwards. So what is... Uh, what message T sends to S? What is this belief state? This is no minus, so it's really, uh, if you like, all the messages from above and below, but here I'm dividing it by the message that S sends to T from below. So why is that? You remember when you update, right? At node S, there are messages coming from below and there are messages coming from above. All of this really, this message will give you the belief of node xt, but I'm dividing it by the message that S sends to T from below. So what is that? Because you're not going to send to a node a message that the node sent you. Right? It's the same way, you remember when we wrote the message passing equations, what actually we had is, oh, you know what? We have the product of all the messages from all the children, let's say, of now T, except S. Now that except S has become a division. So that's a new parameterization of the equations, uh, the way originally uh, belief propagation was uh, introduced. In principle, really, I mean, if uh, you do it uh, correctly, uh, both ways, you will get uh, the same answer. So. One way to look is this way, another way is with the message passing, uh, passing as we did it before, so it's the same story. Uh, all right. Now, 
so the version of belief propagation in where uh, you do this division, as I saw you, is called uh, belief updating. Uh, the version for you multiply messages uh, the way we have done in earlier lectures is really the sum uh, product algorithm. So that's what we already have seen. And uh, with this new reparameterization, you get this concept of belief updating, not message updating, basically. OK. All right, so this is. Uh, 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 if it happens that uh, this algorithm, uh, you know, you are operate on a tree, uh, the situation is very simple. Uh, you know, you are going to have, uh, uh, you know, uh, so uh, let me look here. It says, actually, let me, let me uh, because this was in earlier slides, okay? So uh, we are looking now from the messages from top down, all right, from P to S, okay? So uh, we just we wrote this equation, okay, and we said the message from T to S is given um, with this potential times the belief of node xt divided by the message that comes from below from node S. So to, up, to update this message is from above, you need to know a message coming from below. So you need it's not sufficient to only keep track of the beliefs of the nodes. You need to keep track of the message coming from below. And that's why this message is from above. You will see in a lot of books interpreted as uh, conditional posterior probabilities. And actually, in uh, the slides that I gave you for directed graphs, I had written this is like I said, some for a posterior probability. The idea here is you're already uh, considering evidence from below in computing these messages with this parameterization. So you can put sort of the meaning of this being a conditional uh, posterior probability, uh, but uh, the old way that we did, right, uh, you cannot do that, right? So the interpretation is basically that this message is a like likelihood, basically conditional likelihood. I mean, you can see in, uh, for example, this is written for a tree here. Uh, there's no message from below, all right? So you cannot call it a conditional probability. All right. So the uh, parallel protocol, basically, in uh, simple terms, right? So here, you know, we already explained if you go from uh, the leaves to the root, the root uh, uh, to the leaves, and then uh, if you can calculate any sort of marginals uh, that, uh, of interest, and you can calculate the belief states. Uh, but actually, what you can do is you can uh, initialize all the messages to something, and that can be arbitrary, let's say equal to one, and then uh, every node is ready basically to take messages from one of its neighbors, so you update directly the belief of every node as the uh, self potential times the product of all the messages coming from all of its neighbors. There's no any more above and below, you know, uh, downstream uh, and upstream sort of belief. You can actually start uh, updating the belief of all the nodes this way. And uh, when are you going to converge? When basically the messages have converged. And the messages have converged when effectively every node receives information from every other node. Uh, so the, uh, the number of steps basically that you have to iterate this will be as large as the size of your graph. OK? So, uh, so the number of algorithms basically converges uh, linearly uh, with the size of the graph, which is proportional to the number of the nodes in the graph. All right. And uh, uh, if you check the literature, you will find uh, lots of different algorithms for doing parallelization of this. Okay. And um, uh, they, they are extremely fast. And keep in mind, these algorithms are exact. There is no approximation. They are exact. Okay. Uh, so, so they're very nice. OK. Uh, I think Sudi gave you a homework. Uh, you know, that uh, if I remember it, uh, you're supposed to implement uh, a Markov, a Gaussian Markov, a, a Gaussian Markov random field. OK, something like that? Not exactly? It was undirected graph? Um, OK, I had the impression. But it doesn't matter. You have to do so. You did this in homework too. Uh, I doubt it, 
But uh, uh, so let's go through it. Okay. I had the impression it was Homeworld three, uh, if I remember. So here is uh, a Gaussian Markov handle field where the self potential basically are Gaussians. Um, this is sort of unnormalized Gaussian. All right. You close the square, you get a Gaussian, and then you have pair potentials to define psi of s and t. So when you put all of this together, uh, the joint probability of x is really Gaussian. And here I'm writing it. I'm writing it in a sort of an unnormalized form. Okay. So the mean of the Gaussian, uh, if you close the square, you're going to have to invert this matrix A minus 1, B. Uh, and uh, that's a very costly calculation, right? To invert the matrix, uh, it goes to the cube of the size of this matrix. Uh, but if you do this um, calculation using uh, this belief propagation algorithms, you can do it linearly with the size of the graph. So we need to see how you can uh, do uh, belief propagation with Gaussians. Uh, uh, with Gaussian distribution. So here is the idea. So the self potential that I wrote here, if you close the square, it is a Gaussian. So the mean and uh, the precision uh, are written here explicitly. All right. Uh, the uh, the posterior the the marginals at every node uh, come to also be Gaussians. All right, because you can see from here, if the joint is a Gaussian, obviously all the marginals will be Gaussian. So of interest would be to calculate mu t and lambda t. Okay? And you need to do this at a cost that uh, is not the same as uh, inverting that matrix A, but something way more efficient. To be able to do that, you need to manipulate Gaussians. And it sounds like a trivial task, right? When, uh, especially in one dimension, but this can be very complicated. Uh, you can have an explosion of uh, uh, of uh, calculations, as especially if you try to extend this to uh, not just Gaussians, but mixtures of Gaussians. So uh, what you need to know is uh, one simple formula, or two. Uh, one is the product of Gaussians. And you have to write on what is called an information form. So you have to use precisions rather than variances to write this product in a nice form. So if you write this with precisions lambda 1, lambda 2, the product of two Gaussians has uh, a precision, which is the sum of the two precisions, and a mean that is given like that. The normalization constant really is not important. It's given like this. Um, I mean, most of the times, right, the normalization, you know, it is uh, uh, of no interest. Really, you are inter interested on, uh, uh, on mu, in this case, on lambda. All right. Uh, so what we need to do is we need to compute to be able to apply belief propagation, right? So if you look at the belief of state of node XS is the potential of XS times all the messages arriving uh, from its neighbors. So you need to be able to compute this in a closed form as a Gaussian. And then together with this product, get another closed ga form Gaussian. So you can write the belief of node XS as a simple Gaussian. And this is what this calculation has done. Uh, uh, if you write the messages uh, to have a mean mu st and uh, precision lambda st, and you multiply all of this, then you get a nice formula for the belief of node excess to be uh, lambda s. Right? Uh, lambda s, I remind you, comes from uh, the uh, the precision of this uh, single node potential plus the sum of the precisions of all the messages arriving from the neighbors of uh, 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 S uh, uh, to no T, OK? So a very nice formula to update Gaussian messages, right? nothing uh, complicated. And uh, if you want to update, uh, if you want to do message passing and you want to update, let's say, a message from uh, uh, S to T, you notice, by the way, here, I don't assume things coming from above and below, because the idea here is I am initializing everything with one or with some Gaussians that you like. And then I receive messages at every node from all the neighbors. So the message from S to T uh, marginalized in excess. So let me see this in an integral form. You have the single potential of excess, uh, the pair potential of excess and XT. And then all the messages that arrive from uh, uh, the neighbors uh, of node S except node T. Okay. Now, 
I don't want to go through the algebra, but effectively we just have seen that uh, these are uh, Gaussian. Uh, this was also a Gaussian. This was also a Gaussian. Then there's marginalization in excess. So effectively, at the end of the day, you can have uh, a recursive equation that gives you these messages uh, as a closed form Gaussian with a given uh, mean uh, and a given uh, precision lambda. So effectively, you know, if you have this formula handy, uh, the program to do belief propagation for Gaussian Markov Fernando fields, it's literally, you know, a few lines. So is this part of the homework? This is, okay. You see, he forgot that uh, he gave this homework, okay? All right, so this is it. All right. Now he realized he has to solve it too, okay? All right, any questions on this? So uh, now the, the only thing I, I want to say, right, when you look at these formulas for the way of updating messages, somebody will say, but messages are not Gaussian, right? Nothing is, so you want to do it sort of non-parametrically. Uh, and uh, then the idea is, can I do this as Gaussian mixtures? So you know what the problem will be when uh, every message, everything is a Gaussian mixture? What happens when you multiply a mixture component with another mixture component? So if you multiply a mixture of three components with another mixture of three, let's say, Gaussian components, how many components do you get? You have a sum of three Gaussians, a mixture with another three Gaussians. What do you get? Nine. And then you multiply with another three. All right. Or another nine. And it keeps going and, and going. And so you get an explosion of Gaussian uh, components. So usually what people do is, uh, uh, once in a while, they take a mixture of many components and then they project it to a mixture with three components back again. So you lose some information, okay? And uh, uh, so there are lots of algorithms uh, written that uh, try to uh, do sort of uh, this type of things non-parametrically. They are not necessarily exact, right? Because you're gonna lose some information. Uh, if you go from nine components to three, you won't be able to do this exactly, okay? Uh, but it has been done. It has been done for many years, almost 20, Plus years, people know how to do this uh, with Gaussian mixtures. All right, so um, uh, so a, a lot of these techniques go with uh, the name, uh, sort of non-parametric uh, belief propagation, especially if you use a mixture with uh, non-parametric. You know, you're going to say I have a Gaussian mixture. Well, but you know, you're not assuming uh, any parametric form, especially if the Gaussian mixture can have as many components as you wish, right? Uh, but also non-parametric can imply uh, distributions that you represent maybe with samples, right? And that's sort of a very nice way of uh, doing this uh, methods calculation. So rather than trying to fit them in some distribution form, uh, what you do is you represent them with particles, and then when you calculate the message updates, you calculate a new particle distribution to represent that message, okay? So those techniques actually have been extremely successful in, um, in uh, many domains, and, and I would say most probably they are the state of the art uh, for this type of calculation. And another way to, to do this uh, non-parametrically is to use variational approximations, okay? So you approximate the distributions um, with, uh, uh, some, uh, you know, you introduce some variation approximations, and then the question is, how do you compute these new uh, variational approximations? And that's something we will discuss uh, uh, later in the course. We will spend maybe two or three lectures on the topic. Uh, by the way, if um, this Gaussian problem that I briefly went through and you will do in the homework, uh, if um, your model is sort of a linear dynamical system, uh, the equations that you get with messages passing, etc., they come actually to be identical to uh, Kalman filtering. So, you know, this message passing algorithm will give you exactly the same answers as uh, Kalman filter does. Uh, the equations look uh, more complicated, you know, conceptually, but actually much, way more, much more elegant than uh, the, the derivation of the Kalman filter equations. Okay? And, uh, 
So we will actually review a lot of these things because data simulation is important. So I want you to get this uh, concepts in detail as we go through the course. Okay, uh, so we have uh, 45 minutes to uh, finish uh, the junction tree algorithm that we discussed. And basically, I'm not going to do anything new. Some reparameterization uh, of the algorithm. Uh, and then uh, one sort of uh, cute example of applying the junction tree algorithm to the hidden Markov models a little bit ahead of uh, our schedule. All right, so the first, uh, if you start, let's say, with uh, a directed graph to get a junction tree, the first thing uh, you have to do is moralize. Uh, and uh, once you moralize, you replace all the directed edges with undirected edges. So here is uh, uh, moralization marrying the parts x1 and x4 with this red line. This is the factorization of the directed graph, and this is what I have for the undirected graph, so you can, uh, the color supposed to represent uh, the one-to-one -one correspondence. I mean, really, that's not an issue, but this probability here is this psi potential, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this is a, uh, a little bit more um, uh, complicated example. Uh, X4 has three parents, so basically you have to marry all of them, so it's not sufficient to marry X1 and X2. And you say if X1 is uh, uh, the husband of X2, uh, and X2 is the husband of X2, then X1 is the husband of X3, right? No, they have to uh, uh, have uh, an individual certificate of marriage here. So we need to connect X1 and X3 also, okay? And uh, uh, so this is how the undirected graph would look like. Uh, if you have evidence, we already discussed this, Really, there is nothing uh, specific you need to do, but take slices of these potentials, okay, by fixing to the given values whatever nodes with evidence you have. So in this case, let's say if x3 and x4 are given, effectively you take a two-dimensional slice from, let's say, this four-dimensional table here, one-dimensional slide, etc. And in principle, the uh, query nodes in this problem become x1, x2, x5, x6, and x7, and literally, um, you can think of this separation. Uh, X1, X2 are separated from X5, X6, and X7. So really, you can do this sort of inference sort of in a, in a very trivial manner. You don't really have to uh, uh, mix things together that don't depend on each other. All right. Uh, so the, uh, we came up with... Uh, the undirected uh, uh, graph, right? And uh, uh, the next step was to, uh, let me see if it is written here already, or uh, it will be on the, well. So there was another step that's maybe going to come on the next slide, uh, because it's not a problem on, on this particular graph. What was the other step that was very essential? After moralization, what do we have to do to create clicks that they are not uh, you know, they don't lead to loops, basically. What was the buzzword we used to get a junction tree? We have to do what to the graph? For example, uh, if, uh, let's say, in my direct graph, if, the, if this was not there, were you going to be happy? If the edge CD was not there, What was the word, what is the step you have to do, basically, before you start getting, uh, uh, you know, your junction tree? Yep? No? No factograph. Uh, factograph, we left them behind us. What's the word? I see lots of triangulars here. Uh, before that. I just heard it. You guys threw out so many words, you know, one of them was the correct one. No? I heard something. What was it? Triangulation. All right? So you have to triangulate the graph. So if this edge was not there, you triangulate it. So that way, you know, uh, you basically create clicks uh, that uh, have only three members. All right? And then uh, you find the maximum clicks on the triangulated graph. Okay, so uh, the uh, choice is basically, and then you're trying to create a graph, basically, with nodes as maximal clicks, okay? 
and uh, the uh, possibilities basically as we will see I think in, uh, uh, in the coming graph there are more than one okay uh, and uh, in creating this uh, this uh, uh, tree of uh, uh, nodes that contain clicks we have to satisfy a fundamental uh, property to make this problem consistent and we will discuss this in a, with examples today so what was the exact property that we need to satisfy to make this uh, sort of uh, to work for us so for example when I look at this tree here I notice this first node with a click ABD uh, and this uh, node have uh, node D in common so what did we say needs to happen in between this node and that node if they serve node D but all of the other nodes in the uh, in the junction tree need to satisfy what well, need to have what D okay otherwise how is the information going to propagate let's say from here to there to update D if the intermediate nodes have no idea they don't care about D okay so you need basically when you construct you need to satisfy uh, uh, that property otherwise you'll be in trouble now we also introduce the concept of the separators and the separators here are the square nodes that contain uh, the common nodes between let's say this click ABD and the click BCD and in this case are the nodes B and D and they call the separators and uh, uh, don't confuse them with factor nodes or anything like that because here uh, every node including the separators are clicks basically right so I'm, I'm sorry they are not these are the common nodes between those two clicks but basically there is no factors or anything like that uh, the way we did it with factor nodes now you may say well but this is uh, if it's a click it comes with a potential right so in that sense uh, you can uh, uh, think the representation on a factor graph but I'm not going to use that concept today because you know the junction tree uh, as a tree of uh, with click nodes uh, immediately comes with this potential all right so these are the separators all right and uh, can you look uh, basically let's say without discussing about how we do inference right let's look at this node of one click and this node that serve nodes B and D what do you think uh, the importance of separator in this case is? what does it uh, is going to help us to remind us at least what but uh, when this click interacts with that click and updates information uh, of this click and the other way around uh, the updating happens on what nodes? Huh? B and D, the only nodes that they're common to them so in other ways uh, when this sends let's say a message and we will see what that means to this uh, uh, click BCD it's not going to send a message about A because BCD doesn't care about it it has to be only on the nodes that are in the separator okay and, and obviously there is a mathematical issue that we need to specify here and we will see this in, in uh, examples right uh, somehow right uh, how do we get I mean so this is this is let's say ABD that comes with some potential the separator will also come with some potential and I can tell you, you can guess maybe that it will be the marginalization with respect to A of the potential of the click ABD can you see that? I mean the potential of the separator BD will be the marginalization uh, of the uh, click of the potential corresponding to the click ABD but also this separator potential will be the marginalization of the potential of this node with respect to what variable? C but what is the chance that those two potentials will not agree with each other? that's what the algorithm will actually try to uh, uh, obtain that consistency that makes the two marginalizations equal to each other so in some sense uh, having these separators that's what they will do so they will be sending messages basically these two uh, clicks to each other in a way that when you marginalize this with respect to A and you marginalize this with respect to C 
somehow you will get a consistent uh, calculation of the separator potential BB. Yeah. In what process? Yes, yes, absolutely. And this is what we will discuss today. Yes. So we will initialize things, and uh, then we start iterating. You send me a message, I send you a message, everybody sends messages to each other until we're all happy. Okay? So where's graph? I basically told you way too much information, so let's, uh, uh, as the plots come again, we will see this uh, 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 again, so we get the meaning. So again, uh, this is the train and directed uh, uh, graph, and you can see the triangulation process, all right? Uh, so we connected this dotted, uh, uh, the edges there. Uh, this is the definition of the clicks. And effectively, uh, the message that I think uh, we passed last uh, lecture was that there is more than one uh, click trees uh, that uh, uh, can do the job, but we choose the one uh, that uh, it says the algorithm says the maximal spanning tree. All right, so what's the maximum? What's the junction tree? So there are many trees we can pose. So what we said we're going to choose the one that maximizes something. And what is that something? And if you have many choices, which one should you use? So in this case, we have this tree that has two separators. Each of them has two elements. And then we have this tree, which is pretty good. And it has one uh, element on this separator and two on that. Which tree would you like? We have to really find the maximum spanning tree, which you know we will call it the junction tree. And when we say the maximum spanning tree, maximal with respect to what? It has to maximize something. So if you look at those trees, what is different between the two trees? Well, the answer is you have to look at the separators. What is different in the separators in this uh, click tree and uh, in this? The number of nodes. All right, so here you have two and two, and two plus two is greater than one plus two. Okay? So uh, this is how you need to find the maximal click, uh, the maximal uh, spanning tree, and, and uh, there is uh, lots of heuristic algorithms on how to do this. The actual um, calculation is a very hard one, you know, for a complex uh, tree, uh, but usually empirical methods uh, do the job. Okay? So the junction tree has the largest total separator cardinality, and in this case, for example, um, uh, you can notice here uh, if the cardinality here is 2, so uh, 2 plus 2 is greater than uh, 1 plus, I'm sorry, 1 plus plus. Uh, two, okay. And the running intersection property is what we discussed before. If no D is shared between this and this click, it has to be shared also, but any other click in between on the path. Okay. So, uh, and the algorithm basically, I just copied this uh, three seconds before I came from uh, the lecture. You know, I always try to find. Uh, uh, sort of links for you to read more about these things, right? But uh, not sure if you actually do, but uh, so sort of here is an empirical algorithm on how to find uh, this maximum spanning tree, and, and the algorithm is goes under the name of uh, this crystal algorithm, but it's really sort of a heuristic algorithm that works in most cases. Not just for junction trees, but this is very useful in many other contexts uh, as well. So, you know, if you hit this, you will come up to this little animation and an example and, uh, uh, and some original references on the topic. Okay, so uh, we are going to do a new uh, reparameterization of the problem now um, and revisit the junction tree algorithm using the separator potentials. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to first start uh, with a parameterization that of the joint distribution that looks like uh, this ratio that you see here, that is the product of the potentials of all the maximal clicks on my junction tree, divided by the product of the potentials 
of the separators. I mean, conceptually, at least, does this make sense, right? Why you divide here by the potential of the separators? If you do it effectively, what, what is going to happen? Because, you know, these nodes have a lot of common information defined by the separators, so what do you need to do? You have to double count for that. All right? So, uh, so the joint distribution is going to be written like that, and you may say, well, how do I start uh, originally my joint distribution doesn't look like that. So what I did is I gave you a, a trivial way to start uh, defining the separators to be equal to one. So all these potentials, you take them for the separators, you take them equal to one, uh, and then somehow, um, you know, I'm not going to read the whole discussion here. Basically, if the separators are one, and you can affiliate the click potentials in your original uh, undirected graph uh, with the click potentials that you use in the junction tree, then uh, the numerator in that expression is actually the joint probability distribution of all the variables. All right? So again, uh, this is a very general expression I'm going to use. Uh, if you are confused as to uh, why is that, Consider that I'm starting with the denominator to be equal to one, so there's no issue, okay? And, and we will see what happens uh, as we go along. Okay, so um, we are going to do this slightly differently from, um, uh, you know, the parameterization we discussed on the last lecture, but the equations are identical. In other words, if you put the two lectures next to each other and you look at the equations, they uh, look different to start with, but then, you know, with some thinking, they are identical. So here we have separators, all right? Everywhere, okay? We did not have this in the previous lecture. So let's look. Uh, uh, so we're going to start sending messages, basically, from the leaves to the root, and uh, the root of the leaves, let's say, the way we have done it uh, in the past. Uh, and so let's send the message from... Uh, a click node I to click node uh, J. What did we say by our definition of the separator potential? That the only information node I can send to J is about which nodes. So if I want to send some information from I to J, the only information I can send is the information related. It's an update of the nodes that are shared by CI and CJ. I am not going to send to J information about some nodes this um, uh, click contains that are not contained in CJ because that's irrelevant. So if I only am going to send information that is related with the common variables, effectively what I need to do is the message I'm going to send from I to J will be the potential of node I defined by the click of node I where I integrate out all the variables but the variables that are involved in the separator. Make sense? All right? So we send all the information contained here that is common uh, to CJ uh, and explicitly defined through the separator. All right? And uh, uh, if, uh, uh, you know, we do this, uh, how do we, so if the messages are propagated this way, all right, uh, how do we update, basically, uh, the local potentials of each of these nodes? And the idea is, well, you know, take the old potentials, time, uh, if we, this is propagation from the list to the roots, time all the messages that are coming uh, from the child's of I, I mean, the child is, uh, 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 well, so let me see, this is for, uh, update, I, you know, the picture, uh, let me see again. Um, so this, okay, so I'm updating CI, all right? Uh, maybe this picture is not appropriate here. I'm updating uh, CI. Uh, actually, uh, you understand that, uh, why I'm uh, hesitating here? Uh, we're actually updating it. It's from below. will be coming from uh, these notes here, okay? So basically, uh, all the messages that are propagated from the children of no die. Okay? Uh, so basically, you know, I had one graph and I had to use it. Uh, uh, you can use the indices 
and give them the right interpretation the way you want it. All right. Uh, so, uh, so we send messages from I to J, and because this trinitality process, uh, what we need to do is uh, we need to update uh, the uh, uh, messages that uh, we need to update basically the separator potentials. Okay, and so look at this equation carefully, and and try to give some physical meaning to what it says. So effectively, uh, this is sort of a definition, right? But this, you can think of this being the updated potential of the separator Sij. So what this equation says? You remember the information that we pass from node i to j, we have to integrate out all the variables except the ones containing the separator. But I notice here, there's a division from j to i. And again, this is related to what? What concept? I'm going to convince you with a precise calculation why this works, right? But here, this division is very similar to the division we had in the belief propagation algorithm. So effectively, why do we have this on the denominator? We don't want to account for what? The message from J prime. We don't want to double count the messages that uh, basically that i's and j's exchange. So this calculation, when we take the message from i to j, basically we don't want to account the message that j sends to i. Okay? All right. So uh, let me give you the uh, precise algorithm. Then I'm going to give you actually. Uh, 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 actually, let me let me go to uh, uh, to this slide. Okay. This has the derivation and why this algorithm works. So let's consider uh, that we have, uh, so visualize for me because I don't have the picture on this slide, uh, that we have one click that I call it V, all right? And then I have another click that I call it W, and the separator potential is S, right? V, W, and in between S. So what I'm doing is, uh, step one, I'm updating the potential of the separator, and how do I update? By integrating from the potential of the click V of all the nodes, but S, uh, I, mean, uh, I mean, yes, all the nodes except the ones of the separator. We're fine with that? I'm going to show you that this actually works, okay? So we're going to update, we're going to integrate everything from V except the variables of the separator. So then what I'm going to do is, uh, once I have updated the separator potential, I am going to update the potential of the click W. And the way I update it is the old potential of click W times uh, the updated separator potential divided by the original separator potential. OK? That sounds weird. We will see why it works. Uh, uh, obviously, uh, this is passing messages from V to W. So the potential of V is not going to change. It's going to remain exactly what it was. So that's sort of uh, the message that say from below to the root. So now we're going to send messages from W uh, to V. So let's see how we're going to send those messages from W to V. So we're going to have to update the potential of the separator. How do we do this? By taking the potential of W, which remember was updated to this, and we're going to integrate all the variables but those in the separator. And then we're going to update the potential of V which you remember was this, and how are we going to update? The updated potential of the separator divided by the previous value of the potential of the separators times psi v star, which is this. And the potential of W will remain, the updated two stars will remain uh, with what it was before. So messages from uh, V to W, and I'm updating the separator potential 
the W potential, the V potential here doesn't change, and then messages from W to V, I am updating the separation, the separator potential, the potential of V, and the potential of W doesn't change. And uh, look now at uh, uh, something interesting. Why this works? Take uh, the potential of V that uh, when you complete this algorithm and integrate all the variables minus those that belong in S. So what are those variables? So this is Psi V double star, so I plug it in, all right? This is this. This comes outside the summation. Uh, psi V star is Psi V. And what is this? This is Phi star, you see that? So this comes to south. This is the second update of the separator potential, which is what? Is the summation of all the nodes but S from W of Psi W star. Uh, and so what has been, a, and, and, and actually Psi W star is really Psi W double star. So what is the consistent sec, a, a condition that I have this entity being equal to that on the right. So when I send messages from V to W and W to V, at the end of the day, uh, what do I have that satisfies consistency? The potential of the separator is the same, regardless if I computed by marginalization of the potential on the left or the potential on the right. So basically, uh, by you can think of this, you know, uh, a forward and a backward uh, message passing, I have achieved basically the self-consistency, uh, which is uh, exactly what I want. And so this is sort of uh, 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 a construct in between, and, and the concept of the separator is basically to enforce this consistency between the potentials defined by the clicks. If you don't have this uh, sort of explicitly, uh, you will, uh, you know, somehow still you will need to satisfy uh, some consistency relations, but here uh, they are sort of straightforward in, in, uh, in the way we have uh, done it here. So anyways, uh, I gave you this updates basically for the previous picture. This is the slide before, so I'm not going to repeat them. So again, the, uh, uh, you update, so if you, let's say, you send messages from here to there, so we have to update basically the potential uh, of the separator. This is what we did. Um, then you have to update uh, the potential of this click by uh, multiplying the previous values of that potential with psi star divided by psi. And you remember we start with uh, uh, the separator potential to be equal to one. And then you do the backward step. So you marginalize uh, psi i star for everything except the separator variables and then you update as you send messages from i to j you update the potential of j with this factor and at the end of the day uh, you achieve consistency and uh, by the way when uh, this is uh, you know during all of these uh, calculations the marginal distribution um, the you know the the joint probability distribution of all the variables remains uh, unchanged, okay? And I think there is some point in the slides that uh, uh, shows that, uh, but basically the, you don't play with the joint probability distribution uh, with all these local updates because the local updates maintain the joint probability distribution to be, to be uh, the same during iterations. Uh, and actually, uh, here is, you know, I am um, I'm giving a proof of what I just said with a trivial example that P of X uh, does not change basically uh, in either the forward or the backward step, uh, it remains the same. Okay, so I'm, I want, uh, you know, I have uh, 12, 13 minutes and I want to do one example uh, that sort of it sounds like an overkill, right? But I wanted to show you how you can actually uh, apply this to real problems. So this is for hidden Markov models that I will start discussing in detail on uh, Thursday. But I wanted to do the junction tree algorithm with these separators for the uh, HMM model today. For those who have not seen it, uh, the uh, HMM model basically has some hidden dynamics. So this notes that you see on the top is the system state that evolves with some dynamics. And uh, right now we assume that the model is Markovian. 
So the probability of being on a given state here depends only on the state that you were before and is defined by this transition matrix A. And somehow you want to infer these hidden states by some noisy observations that I call them here Y0, Y1, Yt, Y uh, capital T, or something like that. So we want to do sort of the junction tree algorithm. Uh, and in the process, you can discover with uh, 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 probabilistic graphical models all the equations from uh, you, you know or you may not know about Kalman filtering. And also, you can derive any sort of extensions to Kalman filtering you're interested for any sort of distributions. So way further than Kalman filtering, OK? All right. So the distribution of the uh, hidden states, I hate using uh, uh, Q, you know, here, but somehow I had no time to change the slides. So the state is Q, the observations are Y. Uh, so the joint probability distribution of Q and Y is given by the probability of the initial state. This is the transition probabilities from QT to Q2 plus 1. And this is the observation model. You're familiar, most probably, I hope, with that, right? Some sort of, yes, a little bit? All right. So, uh, again, I want to, uh, uh, as an overkill uh, application, right, because you try to apply something that is very general to a trivial problem that we know the answer. It may sound like an overkill, but it's a very good uh, 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 overkill. So the, if we call the transition uh, matrix AIJ, uh, the, um, you know, in the joint distribution here, right, uh, I can write, if I go back, this is the probability of QT plus 1 given QT. So if I know the matrix A with components AIJ defined the way you see here, so I go from state I on uh, time step T uh, to, uh, uh, you know, to state J on T plus 1, I can write this as AIJ to QTI QT plus 1J. Uh, from, and I'm assuming here I have a multinomial distribution so the values of uh, the states can be m different values at each time. All right? Can you see this? So, I mean, obviously, these QTIs, uh, they are all zeros, except, you know, some of them will be 1. And those that will be 1, they will give me the correct uh, element for my transition matrix AIJ. There's nothing fancy there. OK? So, uh, the joint probability distribution is again the probability of the initial state plus this transition, probabilities from the dynamics, and, and times the observation model. So, the, when we do a state space, um, a state space models uh, in the next uh, uh, week or so, the fundamental problems uh, in the context of data simulation is basically if you're given uh, data to time t to estimate the state at time t, that's what is called the filtering problem. Uh, the prediction problem is if you are given data up to time uh, s to do predictions ahead of your observations. That's the prediction problem. And then the smoothing problem is if you are given uh, observations from now until tomorrow, can you predict this evening what the state is? So you are using a lot of data, including future data, to predict the state at a given earlier time. And it's called smoothing, obviously, because this would be way smoother answer than what you would get uh, with filtering. So all of these problems, you can address them with probabilistic graphical models. And uh, actually, with alpha and beta messages, the way we did for, for chains. But I will, again, do another thing today to use the junction tree algorithm to solve this problem, OK? Just so you can get uh, uh, the practicality of the junction tree algorithm. Uh, if you don't, you know, if you try to do this sort of uh, uh, without uh, uh, thinking deeply, so if you want, for example, to calculate the marginal of the observations, you can see the summation here. It's huge because if you have t steps and each state that you have to sum takes m values, this is m to the time, uh, m to capital T uh, calculations. So this is very expensive. We need to be able to do this type of uh, problems uh, with uh, uh, way better than uh, this exponential cost. Okay. I 
I don't think I will be able to finish it now realizing it, but let's uh, try to do our best. Uh, so uh, a few reminders of uh, uh, some of the things. Again, uh, we will come and uh, discuss them slowly uh, in uh, follow-up lectures, but I want to bring the, the junction tree right now. So let's call that our problem is to calculate uh, given, uh, uh, let me see what Y is, given Y uh, from time zero to time capital T, I want to find what the state QT is, okay? So this is really the smoothing problem, right? So the calculation that you see here is the smoothing problem. I am not going to go through the derivations because I don't have uh, uh, the time and since we will repeat this, right? Let me just say that uh, by using this um, uh, basic uh, uh, product rule uh, probability uh, loss and also uh, by using uh, conditional independence relations implied by this graph, basically that, uh, uh, let's say, given the node QT, QT plus 1 is independent of QT minus 1, all right? This type of independence relations, you can show that this moving probability, it's really the product of an alpha message, which is a forward message, times a backward message beta, divided by P of Y, the marginal of Y, and the definition of the alpha message is this entity here, and the definition of the beta message is this entity there. Uh, if you look at this definition that comes basically when you do the derivation, is uh, very simple, is the, is the probability that you will observe y0, y1, yt, and then you will end at state qt, all right? So alpha is really uh, something that accounts for the, all your observations up to time t, so it's a forward calculation, but it says it's the joint probability of the observed data up to little t, assuming that you finish on state qt. And the bigger message is actually uh, a little bit different, is the conditional distribution of the observations from t plus 1 to capital T, uh, given that you started on state qt. One is the message that you know, or is the distribution of this data uh, and uh, you finish at state T. The other one is, given that you start at state T, you observe this data. Okay? Now, why do we call this uh, forward and backward messages? Uh, you know, we already have derived actually this. I know this is an earlier lecture. So let me just uh, tell you, uh, you can show, uh, uh, and, and again, we will do this derivation, you can show that these messages that I have to calculate the smoothing of uh, probability are basically can be calculated with the recursive and have the recursive equations for the alpha message and the recursive equation for the beta message. Uh, notice that the updating of the alpha message is a forward update. So if you use the uh, message alpha QT and uh, the uh, observation model and the dynamics to update, so there is a marginalization in QT here, and the beta message is a backward message because you need to know the beta message at say QT plus one. We have seen this message. We yes, when we did change forward and backward, right? Okay. So uh, uh, maybe we didn't see them in the context of you know we just saw them in the context of a, a single chain. Here is a hidden map of model, so it's really uh, a state evolving. Uh, that's what we did before, but now we have this observation, so, but literally, this is the update equation, this is the update equation for the backward message. Now, uh, there is uh, uh, another uh, backward uh, message that you can send, and uh, it is, uh, uh, you know, you will not see this in many books, but uh, you will see that actually the, uh, the algorithm that we get with the junction tree implies a backward propagation related to, not to the message beta, but to this message gamma. And this message gamma, you know what it is? It is the posterior of QT, given all the observations from Y0 to Y capital T. So this backward message again is the posterior of QT given all the observations of the capital T. And you may say, why it's a backward message? Because if you do the calculations and they are sort of, uh, trivial, they only use this operation to show, to account for some conditional independence, you can show that the gamma QT 
to compute it, you have to compute the masses gamma QT plus 1, and then marginalize with respect to QT plus 1. So basically, I don't want you to, uh, right now, to worry about um, uh, the details of the equations, but basically, there is a beta message propagating backwards, uh, but also there is a gamma message, if you like, that's a little bit different, okay? They have different definitions, okay? And the idea is, if you know this alpha message and the beta message, or the gamma message, effectively, you can calculate uh, the smoothing probability distribution of QT given all the data. So if you have all the observations, you say, give me a nice smooth prediction of the state QT, it's effectively multiplying at each node the forward and the backward message the same way we have done it for a chain. Remember for a chain, that's what we did when we calculate the posterior. Right? At every node, take the forward message, the backward message, this is it. All right, I only have one minute, so I'm not going to do anything uh, except to tell you uh, how we're going to do this uh, when I come back on Thursday. We're actually, uh, we're going to postulate a junction tree, okay, where we're going to have clicks that define the dynamics. So, for example, this click will be uh, the probability of Q1 given Q0, this click will be the probability of Q2 given Q1, and what this click will be, the probability of Y1 given Q1, the probability of Y2 given Q2, and what those little squares will be, will be the separator potentials. So what we will do is, we will start sending messages uh, from here, from here to there, but also receiving notes from this click, and the other way backwards, and we will see the update formulas we get with the junction tree, they are basically identical to the alpha and gamma updates uh, that uh, you get with uh, the classical lengthy proofs uh, using conditional independence and the like. Okay? Uh, this are slides are up, uh, so if you do me a favor, I know you guys don't read anything unless uh, it's in the homework. Alright? You don't read anything unless it's in the homework. So, this is in the homework. Make it in the homework, okay? The next homework, okay? So make it in the homework because that way you can learn something about data simulation. All right, so see you first thing.